So that was my question. I, I know you were starting recording in the past meeting, so I just wanted to make sure that you hadn't forgotten. So. Thanks. I appreciate ne the help. Never mind. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm, I'm finally getting all this down now. <laughs> so um, I'd like to um, share the agenda. Hopefully folks have seen it. Does any of the members see any changes in the agenda? This was decided at the last meeting to uh, talk about these issues. We have any um, additions or deletions? Hopefully we can get to everything. <laughs> Hearing none. Uh, can we make a motion? Oh, let's actually review the meeting minutes. Here's the meeting minutes from October 10th. Does anyone have any additions or deletions from the meeting minutes? No, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Anyone want a second? Yep, I'll second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those aye. not in favor, say nay. Hearing none, I will accept the meeting minutes. As noted, I will also um, Note that the September 29th meeting minutes were was dated improperly on September 27th, so I fixed those in the former meeting minutes just to give you all a heads up. OK. So thank you all for approving the meeting minutes. We're on to the next agenda item, which is to review and discuss some terms. ANC permit terminology and statute. So I've prepared a presentation for all of you. And I'm just gonna pull that up. So this was some terminology that we called out in the last meeting that we would review uh, for this uh, meeting. And so some of those terms are highlighted. So this is exactly from statute 10 VSA, chapter 10, uh, section 1455D. There's no reasonable non-chemical alternative available. There's an acceptable risk to the non-target environment. There is negligible risk to public health. There's a public benefit to be achieved from the application. And in Chapter 10, Section 1455F, there is an acceptable risk and a negligible risk and public good. So those are some terms that I hope to get to all of them. I'm not sure if we will get to all of them today. Um, but we'll do our best. So the term reasonable non-chemical alternative already in the permit, um, we have a list of a dozen questions 
that we go through when we're uh, reviewing the applications. So I don't, I think for ease of time, I'm not going to read through every single question, um, but generally um, it's about the purpose of the, of the um, using pesticide, what is the long-term management strategy, strategy, is it invasive species or not, is it a whole lake treatment or not, um, have there been other control activities that have been utilized over the historical presence of that uh, aquatic nuisance species and did it work? Uh, what is the chemical, physical, and biological status of the water? And how does it re relate to the lake scorecard, which is a, um, a way to measure the score, the lake's health? And that is done through the Lakes and Ponds program. Um, what non-chemical controls have been available and did they work? Um, what is the likelihood of it succeeding? And what activities may be impacted, whether non-target, human, or otherwise? So, uh, so this is a permit. So please, if you have any questions, please definitely uh, shout out. Uh, so Olin, would you like to explain um, these highlighted areas from this permit example? Sure, yeah. So um, whenever we get an application like this, um, kind of the first thing we look at really is, is what it is they're trying to do, um, what they're wanting to control, and then we really start to look at what the history of the water body is um, and how um, other if if other methods have been used to utilize or to, to control a specific species and if so how effective they were and so whenever we get um, that's that's where this term reasonable comes in um, you know if we get an application that to, to come in to control uh, it, it, this came up recently uh, somebody wanted to control uh, the plants in a small private pond um, and they wanted to use an herbicide uh, and it was pretty much immediately denied based on it not being not not having found um, this specific condition within statute. Um, and so whenever we look at something like a, a like fairly application where they've been managing a, a plant for a long time um, and they haven't really been able to knock it back to manageable levels and they're they're kind of in a losing battle. Uh, that's where the, this this term reasonable comes in, where these these other methods of tr of management are not working. Um, and so that's that's where this comes in. And so when you look at things like their locations that they're looking for, um, that sort of thing. And then we start to look at the the trend scores. Um, so one thing we want to consider is 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 there something that that can be done outside of the lake to help manage um, the the plant or the the nuisance species? And so uh, an in, an instance where this came in um, was. You can see here, like like fairly, they um, they have a, a fairly poor trend in water quality standards, um, and so something that we may require in in the permit, uh, and you'll see this later on whenever we also talk about uh, long term management plans. It's another thing within statute, uh, but something that we may require within per within the permit is to implement other methods outside of the lake to reduce nutrient loading to, to and to improve overall lake health. We want to really make sure that the lake um, is resistant and to, to any you know issues and, and will recover in a healthy way. So those are all things that we consider whenever we're, we're talking about the term reasonable. Thank you. <clears throat> so right now we do not have a term defined as reasonable, but as you just saw that we do go through that list of different um, permit conditions that we're looking for. And so here's some definitions of the term reasonable through different dictionaries. And I might also add this whole presentation was really done by Misha Setner, who was the permits, the aquatic nuisance control permit specialist formerly. And he did a lot of this work with a pre-rulemaking group. So I'm really just using the body of work that Misha already uh, completed, so I just want to give him a shout out. Uh, so here are some 
definitions and, and an existing definition from um, the Vermont River uh, standard. So reasonable and feasible will, was used, means available and capable of being implemented after consideration of cost, existing technology, logistics in light of the overall project purpose, environmental impact, and ability to obtain all the necessary approvals for implementation. So that's just something to think about. So, so I can I make a can I ask a question? Of course. Or I, I noticed Hannah's with us, and I it would be helpful to me if she could, um, where it where it's relevant, maybe provide the legal context or any. Has there ever been a litigation over this the use of reasonable? in this section of statute and actually before you answer that though i'm going to ask one more time if guests can people who are not on the committee could turn off their cameras because it's pretty distracting um this is hannah smith um i'm not aware of any litigation over the use of the re this reasonable criteria under the ANC permitting program. Um, I can take a dive into that. I'm not sure that, at least not in recent memory, but I won't say that that means it's never happened. Um, but typically my understanding is the agencies, um, you know, the use of that criteria has been implemented um, without challenge by the agency so far, so. Thank you. And and I'll add to, to that. I, during my deep dive of, of permit history, I don't think I found anything either dating back to at least 2000 regarding this. Thanks. So <clears throat> with that, knowing that, that it hasn't been challenged, but there does seem to be um, some potential uh, way to improve how we as a permitter uh, go through these applications. Should we make it clearer to permittees and applicants um, what reasonable is? And so I just wanted to throw that out to the members. Are we utilizing this approach in an adequate, adequate way? Do you think it's lacking? Should we add anything? Should we add a specific definition, Eric? Um, sorry, two two comments. One, I I think that the the definition you're proposing on on the screen right now, um, potential definition looks looks pretty good to me. Um, I just wanted to say that I I don't necessarily think it's an either or, where you either do chemical control or non-chemical control. I think oftentimes when when folks are looking to do chemical control, they're also already doing some form of non-chemical control. So I don't know how to capture that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think what we're looking for here is that if you're moving to chemical control, that there's some determination that everything else that you've been doing and might continue to be doing is not sufficient. Correct. If that makes sense. Yeah, that because <clears throat> that we already require that in a, as a condition that they have had to attempt to do non-chemical alter alternatives, and they all failed or did not come close to really right. meeting the objective exactly. So, so for your potential definition, I, I think just adding something at the end that but these methods have not been sufficient. Mm. I don't know if failed is the right word because I think mm -hmm. oftentimes they're successful to some extent and people want to continue doing dash and bottom barriers and, and other things. Um, but the, you know, in this case, we're looking at the negative that there is no reasonable non chemical alternative. And so I think just adding to, to your potential definition, I would suggest adding something to the effect that the, the other methods. While they may have some utility, are are not sufficient. Okay. And that would be the the determination that we would be looking for under the quant nuisance control permit for pesticide use. Okay. 
What I can do is just add that in the working document as well in, in the draft report, and we can all kind of massage that a little bit with the wording. Does anyone else have any other points to raise? Uh, do you believe that the, those questions that we go through as permittees um, should be asked directly to those applicants, um, which would make the process longer and the application lengthy, lengthier? Eric. If, if you can jump back to that list of sure. questions. Mm -hmm. There were there are two questions that I, I thought kind of got to the, the heart of it. And it was question number five and number nine. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I think if you asked those of the applicants, not not necessarily all 12, mm -hmm. but if you asked those questions. Um, somewhere in the in the permit application, I think that might be helpful. Yeah, Olin, do you know specifically, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, no, about <laughs> which, <laughs> which questions are exactly noted in the application? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that some of these are actually. So, so I, I'd have to read through an application. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly what quite, I didn't, I didn't write the applications in the pre me mm -hmm. but, um, I'd have to read through it to see exactly what questions I will. I will say, but I, I think that's not. I think that's a good I, addition, potential mm -hmm. addition. I will say that those are required through the process to be included in the uh, appendix or like the the additional documentation that they must provide, like in mm -hmm. their long term management plan whenever they apply. Um, but I think maybe calling them out and requiring them in the actual application could be something that may be um, doable. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that might be a good idea. OK. But I, I will I just wanted to yeah, I will mention that yeah, we do require those things to be brought up, but um, not not within not within the application itself, I don't believe. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, do I hear does anyone else have any other questions about reasonable? Back to the other side. Um, <clears throat> did anyone have any question about the approach we're using to make this determination? Right now we ask the questions, we review it. We note those findings in the permit. And incorporate that into the permit itself. Hey, I don't see. Oops, sorry, I'm kind of skipping around here. <laughs> Lost my place. Hey, Eric, you have your hand up. Yeah, just just one other thought or or comment as as we discuss this is that I think one of the the challenges that we talked about in the the pre rulemaking work group was sort of the the scope of what's mm -hmm. being proposed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure exactly how to to capture that, um, but I, yeah. I think that that question of reasonable alternatives is is also somewhat scale dependent. Yeah, and certainly for those non-chemical um, options, scope and scale are are you know really the determining factor for using those non-chemical alternatives um, and there's some of them are costly so we tried to capture that in the draft report as well um, looking at the scope and scale of each project or practice i should say yeah just i i don't know if there's any way for us to yeah you know, I, I see the words in there but it, yeah. as far as kind of including some some guidance in that uh, might might be helpful mm -hmm. 
we may we may be able to in those questions we may be able to put something into that as well regarding scope and scale um i know it's something we've talked about a little bit in the internal review procedure um i mean it, it does talk a little bit about scale but maybe we can make it a little more apparent or something well that's a good idea just write in and uh, question and then it can be referenced potentially in a definition that, that yeah. could be approved Great idea. OK, does anyone have any other questions about reasonable? Or comments? Moving to hearing none, I'll move to the next, which is acceptable risk to the non target environment. Um, I just really I'm talking about acceptable risk to non target environment, but really just highlighting acceptable acceptable risk. So currently we identify the non target environment as is demonstrated here, the aquatic plant and animals within the water body proposed for the treatment and wires to one mile downstream of the water body, the wetlands. The human use of waters treated with a pesticide, including um, different commercial interests and the ecological integrity of the water body, as identified in the DEC Watershed Management Division's statewide surface water management strategy. So, what does that look like in the permit? Um, is highlighted here. And this is how we make our de determination, is considering those immediate and long-term impacts to aquatic plants, rare, threatened, and endangered species, the effect of the control activity on aquatic animals, the effect of the control on the wetlands, and the effect of the control activity on the human use of the waters, and then the cumulative effect of all of those um, non-target items mentioned prior. So here is an example of how we call this out in the permit. And Olin, would you like to share some of those highlights. Sure, I, I think Eric, did you have a question before I go oh, into that? I can't, I can't see you guys. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, apologies if I'm over talking here. No, uh, it's but great. If, if you can go back to mm -hmm. either one of the previous slides, um, just just an observation that that these appear to me to be more of a, a definition of the non-target environment than of acceptable risk. Yeah, I'm I'm putting it in the context for how they're used. Right, but this and the, the next slide really seem mm -hmm. again to be to be capturing how we define the non-target environment. Yeah. Um, but don't don't really put kind of sidebars or parameters around how we define acceptable risk. Right. Maybe that's coming. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> all right. <laughs> And I, and I think it's important here to know that that acceptable. The, the, the definition for acceptable risk starts to differ between departments, because this is really where the internal review procedure comes into play. And so this is where Fish and Wildlife will comment and they will view what is acceptable to their program. Um, and then wetlands may comment and they may have a different approach to the term acceptable and what they view as acceptable. Um, but but so this is really where internal review procedure starts to come in. Um, and so just as a quick overview, the, over, the internal review procedure uh, was signed, I believe, in May, April um, of this past year um, mm -hmm. by the three commissioners. Uh, and it's been uh, it's been in use unofficially for quite a few years now, but uh, it was it was officially signed uh, this this past year. And so that really defines who needs to be uh, commenting on what and what departments are responsible for those comments. Um, and so, you know, I I recognize as the regulator that I am not a specialist in fish. I'm not a specialist in wetlands. 
Um, I'm not a specialist in rare, threatened, or endangered species. And so we really want to make sure that during these applica this application process, that the experts in those fields are determining what the, the acceptable risk is. Um, I, I, I know very little about public health, and that is why the Vermont Department of Health comments on this. Um, and so, again, they, th that term acceptable starts to change a little bit program to program, but overall, we, we bring that together, I bring that together within the program um, to determine conditions that will protect the non-target environment that X program is concerned about. Um, and so you can see here um, that a few rare aquatic plant species were recorded in Lake Fairley. Um, and so what that may look like in a permit uh, is requiring a rare threatened and endangered species takings permit from uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, to, to be applied for and approved before, well, in conjunction with our own aquatic nuisance control permit. Um, you'll also see, I apologize, there's a there's an F-35 flying over my head right now. Um, but uh, you, you will also see things like wetlands conditions that, that may come into play. Our most recent um, lampreside permit that, that was approved required a uh, required a physical barrier between a, a new class one rep wetland and the, the body of water to protect the wetland. Um, and so you'll, you'll see things like that start to pop up in these conditions where we start to implement this definition of you know, what, what we're going to allow um, to impact the non-target environment. And, and with that, that's that's one of the reasons that our the, the, the pesticides that have been approved have started to change. So in the 70s and 80s, we were approving 2,4-D, um, and that started to shift as new technologies and understandings of the chemicals have become apparent. Um, and so now that we have more targeted pesticides, we can really narrow down the, the scope of what's going to be controlled by a pesticide. So something like Prosilicor has a very narrow um, or very short list of, of plants that are controlled, and they're controlled within a very specific uh, prescription dose unit, which is how they measure uh, things like Priscilacor. And so that's where this starts to come in, uh, where we've kind of shifted how how we approach this. So uh, based on what Olin just uh, mentioned, so these are basically comments from the internal um, review procedure uh, partners. And so we add those comments into the permit conditions. And uh, I'll add to one of the big ones. You can see it's highlighted here that that's been added. And, and Eric has talked about this in the past is that no more the, than 40% of the littoral zone may be targeted. But what that really means is that we want to protect 60% of the vegetative littoral zone. And so we've worked with Fish and Wildlife in years past to implement a condition like this so that they're, you know, the, 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 what their experts on is being protected through the projects that that we have to oversee. Um, so again, this is how we work within partners. Um, and you can see here, there's the. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, if you could go back to that slide. Uh, about halfway down, there's also it talks about maximum uh, application rates of, of PDUs or prescription dose units. And so you can see that that this is also restricting how much of a chemical they can implement or they can put into a body of water to protect plants, um, certain plants are controlled at higher uh, PDUs. And so we restrict the amount so that those things can't be, so those things won't be impacted or the potential for impact is much, much lower. Yeah, and then again, we we, we start to go into, um, we, we require pre-treatment pre plant surveys uh, and post-treatment plant surveys. And those are so we can, do a statistical analysis, which we completed, I believe, last in 2021, to see if we're seeing any statistical change um, in plant populations, frequency of occurrence, that sort of thing. Um, and again, that, that's that's why we require these things. Uh, and that's so if for some if if something is happening, we can then go back and say, okay, we need to lower the amount that they're treating a lake with. We need to change the dates in which they're allowed to treat a lake with um, that sort of thing. So just to summarize, we do look at all the um, non-target environments and whether there is a risk 
and whether that risk is acceptable. Uh, so we try to limit uh, both the scope and the amount of pesticides used. We um, limit the locations. Um, we do provide pre and post uh, qualitative and quantitative plant surveys. And so I think we determine if there is and going to be an acceptable risk. Does anybody have any questions about those permit conditions? I, I know you have a hard time seeing when I raise my hand, so I'll yeah, just thanks. speak up. Yeah, um, appreciate it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, part of, part of the challenge that we've discussed multiple times over the years is that these uh, permit um, criteria, you know, acceptable, negligible, are are somewhat open to interpretation and as Olin said different folks different programs within and you know outside of state government might have very different ways of of interpreting what acceptable is mm -hmm. um and it, it may vary based on whether you know the impact is to a common species or to a threatened and endangered species for example um so it, it'd just be nice if if we could add in some some language you said you've been doing statistical analysis as to you know like what level of change might trigger concern um for a common species for uh for a rare or threatened or endangered species um just just to add something that that's a little more objective to the the assessment of acceptable risk and you know one of one of the things that we often look at when we're commenting on them is does it have a a population level impact um, because we have we know that some people feel that killing a, a single individual plant or animal is unacceptable um but in terms of processes like these our department is looking more at does it have a, a population level impact which again could vary based on how how rare the the species is so just and also, you know, to go on that point, Eric, it's also on the common species too. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, when we look, look at the pre and post uh, data for plants, there could be other environmental variables that are affecting the, those plant populations. So I think it's, you know, it gets at how can you have a quantitative measure to ensure that those populations maintain their abundance or frequency of occurrence. But how do you know that those impacts are just due to those pesticides or are not due from other uh, variables? And then is that across the board? Do we look at all different types of species? Do we have to have a measure of quantitative data and thresholds for all different species? So how do you know how would that work? How would that work for um, mud puppies, or how would that work for you know uh, frogs or fish? You know, so I I think it would be very complicated to have some sort of quantitative threshold. So that's something I, we have always. I agree. It, with. It's it's yeah. super complicated, <laughs> and there's there's probably not one metric that you know can can basically apply to all cases um, yeah. but to the extent that you're already you know looking at statistics and trying to assess impacts to the extent that you can you can make that um you know more more obvious or more transparent in the process i think mm -hmm. that would help with some of the you know the different interpretations of yeah. the criteria yeah, I think that's why, you know, we originally um, did that statistical analysis just for our own purposes, but then it was it was interesting how the public was interested in that as well. So I think, um, you know, we hope to expand at least the plant survey data because it is limited because we only have 11 bo water bodies that are used uh, for pesticide treatments but I was going to reach out to other states and try to get their data as well. So here's some terms 
of acceptable risk. They have been used um, both acceptable in dictionaries and as acceptable risk in different engineering or um, uh, I think this was, oops, sorry. This was involving um, um, like an organization. So we can certainly look at trying to, to define acceptable risk, if that would be helpful, or like you said, the thresholds. So I'd like to ask the members, other members that are kind of silent, <laughs> uh, what do you feel about the determination that we're making? Where is it lacking? What could be added? And this is the potential definition that was raised by the pre rulemaking group. Does anyone have anything else to comment on with these? Again, we can put this in the report and then we can continue to massage these definitions if you feel that's appropriate. And I can't see anybody, so I'm not sure if anybody's shaking their head or. <laughs> okay, so we will move forward. Uh, oh yes, is what we consider non-target environment adequate? Um, and again, these are the non-targets that we're looking at. So are there other non-target environments that we should be including? And I'll just I'll just note here that the public health is is in a different yeah. section. Yeah. So public health is considered. OK, hearing none, I will move to the acceptable risk. Oh, so this is the potential def definition that we can use and put in the report. And this is the determination of negligible risk to public health. So I'll ask Sarah to comment, please, on this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I did just put the quotes around negligible. Um, I, in the pre making group, I think this was discussed to some extent. Um, I, my schedule wasn't very flexible this summer, so unfortunately I was not able to make it to a single one of those groups to weigh in on any of that um, conversation, but uh, so the finding for ne negligible risk to, to public health, um, if a definition is needed, it would be needed for the word negligible. Uh, risk to public health is defined in the health statute. So there's a link here, it's Title 18. So our statute defines public health risk, significant public health risk and public health hazard. Those are definitions that are used not only in my work in toxicology, but in other types of work we do in environmental health, and then in work that applies across all of the other health department divisions as well. Um, I, I don't know that I need to read these verbatim. Um, okay. So our, you know, I think if negligible, if there's a desire to define negligible, I think there are some pretty uh, Simple definitions that we could find even from a dictionary, you know, something like it means insignificant, um, so small as to not warrant action. So I think that that could be 
put in the report if there's a desire for that one. Uh, do we have any comments from the committee members about potentially adding in a, a definition for negligible or just accepting the public health definitions as they are already noted? William? Dr. Bress? Um, <clears throat> I think it could go into a little more detail. Um, so negligible risk you need to define what's being neglected. So what is the level of concern? So uh, a statement of the level of concern and what you see here includes a lot of that A, B, C, D uh, and E. And then th there are a number of things which wouldn't contribute to being negligible risk, such as uh, non-measurability, the fact that you couldn't detect it doesn't really factor into it being negligible. Something like uh, a custom level of risk. So well, I think you froze there for a second, Dr. Bress. Well, uh, Dr. Brez, you're still frozen. Hope we can get you back because that was a really good comment. Um, and hopefully we can capture that in the report. Uh, OK, so I think I'm, I realize it's 48 minutes and I believe we are out of time for this section. So I'm going to end the show and just see how our time is doing and get back to everybody. Let's see, so 12.50, it's 1.30. Oh, we have 15 more minutes. Brilliant. We're doing pretty good. Um, so we have 15 more minutes to look at public benefits. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation. <clears throat> So public benefit and public good is next on the list. So as it's stated in um, the, the permit, oh, there's Dr. Bress again. Dr. Bress, I'm sorry, you were cut off or frozen. Uh, you, you, <laughs> you will not believe this. The <laughs> cable company is here and they shut off my Wi-Fi. Oh my goodness, bad timing. So, I'm, I'm hooked up to my phone right now. So OK, should I just keep going? Or? Yes, please, please oh, do. Okay. Yes. So I was saying there there are three things probably don't apply to negligible risk. One was the non measurability. The second was um, a custom levels of risk of certain populations such as pesticide applicators and background levels. Oh boy. Still hear me? Yes. Oh, OK. I'm getting confused between my computer and my phone here. Um, OK, so um, the description was being neglected. And then um, a rigorous scientific review is needed to develop some type of acceptable level, which would be some type of reference level for the particular application, application that you're looking at. Uh, and these will take into account things like uh, potential adverse effects description, evaluation of the scientific data available, and the extent of the scientific uncertainty. So I think negligible risk probably could be defined a little more in depth. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those comments. Uh, so Sarah, I know that you have reviewed, so the Agriculture Innovation Board approves the use of the pesticides in Vermont. And so I'm sure that they go through those types of risks to the public health. 
And would you be able to comment on that? Because I have not reviewed the Agricultural and Innovation Board's um, approval. Um, they, the, uh, from my work with the Agency of Agriculture, both under Vermont Pesticide Advisory Council, VPAC, which was the former council and then Agricultural Innovation Board, they they don't as a whole work on public health. So the health department always does that. So that that has been me for 11 years um, and the folks in my group. Um, but but we do all of those assessments, everything that was just mentioned in terms of literature review and the, the effects on human health. So that work is all done. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So I think we just better need to define that of of you know taking Dr. Bress your um, your comments and suggestions in the report and how how to note that in the permit itself too, or whether it's just the conditions too that we look at. Yeah, I mean we in in the I will say in the permit. We know VDHs or the Vermont Department of Health. So we we know your findings on the on the pesticide. So in in the permit, whenever you, if you were to read through a, a, a full permit, which they can be pretty long, um, but the the first section are the conditions. The second section is just kind of general statute, and then that third section is actually the findings based on the statute. So we go through one by one and review each and every one of those. So you can see, I see here, some of these are um, yeah. the findings. So in the, whenever we're doing a finding for the non-target environment, we'll actually go through every non-target environment that we have listed and review the, and and, and we'll, we will um, explain how those findings were met. Um, so the same thing occurred, the same thing does occur with the public health finding, and it's mostly just kind of, what BDH provides to us. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we're not the, the experts on public health. And so that is it is somewhat in the permit, but I mean, if, if yeah. it needs to be better explained, that is something we could do. Yeah, and but I'm sorry, we, we didn't pull that out of the permit and I guess we should have, so I apologize that that's not in there. I think in our, in our folders for the committee members, there are, examples of um, permits and there are examples of comments made by uh, each department. So I have wetlands comments, I have BDH comments, I have fish and wildlife comments. Um, so they're all in there if you if you'd like to review those comments and see and see how those those programs interact with this and how mm -hmm. they, they work through that. Can you can you tell us where what folders are in? Sure. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can get back at that. I can I can do it. Oh, they're, okay, in, um, okay. they're in ANC Act 57 Study Committee Resources. Yep. Um, and then in that, they're under the committee subtopics. And then you'll see uh, current ANC permit examples. So you can go through and look at um, current ANC permits for herbicide. And that breaks it down into Priscilla corn and Lamprocide because those are the only two um, pesticides that are currently approved for use in the state. Um, and then you can read through some of them. Uh, again, our most recent one is Lake Salem. So you can see it, it'll say most recent Lake Salem and you can read through the permit if you'd like. Um, the, the approved permit, you can also, I, I included in this the draft permit so you can see comments that were made by other programs. Um, you can see their application and treatment reports. Um, and then the same thing applies for, I believe they're in, yeah, they're, they're in the, um, the, the, com well, maybe I, I might not have added the comments yet by VDH. I, I should do that. I will make a note to do that if I haven't done so already. But the permits are there, so you can you can see the findings that are made. Thank you.
And I'm trying to see what page that's on, just to note that. Oh yeah, section seven on page 12, page 12. So you can see the findings that we call out from the Vermont Department of Health. And I, and I did just find them actually under under current ANC permit examples. There's some there's another folder called ANC internal review procedure comments from partners. And within that I included the comments made by our mo on our most recent approved pesticide permit, which was signed, I believe, on the 1st of October. Um, and it's for use of uh, TFM lampricide in uh, Pulteney and Hubbardton rivers. And so all of the comments made by the different programs are there. And so I have comments from drinking water, groundwater protection, wetland, Vermont Department of Health, and the monitoring assessment program. Were you able to find that? Amy? Yes, I was. Okay. Yes, thank you. Brilliant. Okay. So uh, it leaves us a few more minutes. So I was it may be best to skip the last term uh, definition of um, public benefit or public good so we have more time to really delve into that um, and then take the time that we have to review the report so how does the committee members feel about um, tabling the public good public benefit for the next meeting Oh, I think we should keep going. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we've been going through them pretty quickly, so. Okay, so determination of public benefit and public good. Uh, as it's noted in the application or the permit is there's public benefit to be achieved from the application of the pesticide or in the case of a pond located entirely on a landowner's property, no undue adverse effect upon the public good. And there's either benefit to or no undue adverse effect upon a public good. So those are two from the two different um, permit conditions. So just calling out again that we are entrusted uh, for Vermont's water bodies uh, through DEC, and we have an obligation to manage the lakes and ponds, which preserves and protects aquatic habitat, as well as aquatic biota and wildlife, um, so on and so forth. So we do consider these charges um, in the permit. And so I just wanted to note that we understand what our role is when we're looking at public good and public benefit. How it's uh, queried in the permit, how we go through and try to find this. This is a lot of information, so I apologize. Um, we look at the degree of what the public benefit is whether they're short or long-term effects, whether it's an, another federal, state, or municipal plan, what's the public access, what are those commercial interests, what is the degree of local interest um, as manifested by municipal input or other contributions, whether it's feasible, whether it's developmental rather than a maintenance program, in other words, whether it's part of a long-term uh, management plan rather than just a one-time shot. Whether there are um, public uses such as beaches or state parks or um, other public uses, uh, water use as well. And what are some of those recreational impacts too? Is there boating, swimming, fishing? And then looking at the cumulative assessment of those findings. So what does that look like in the permit? So here's an example. So within this, oh, uh, Olin, would you like to explain this? Oops. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, I think this is a good 
a, a good point of, of how the other requirements start to kind of come together. Um, so whenever we're looking at something like um, an invasive species, uh, I mean, our, our most commonly controlled invasive species is Eurasian water milfoil. That's the only um, herbicide uh, controlled plant in the state. Um, and then we have lamp, uh, sea lampreys, which are controlled with, with TFM. And so whenever we're looking at these applications, we really start to weigh in what the, the risk to other bodies of water. So with something like Eurasian water milfoil, um, something that would come into play is its proximity to other lakes that may be unaffected, um, class uh, one bodies of water. So A1 bodies of water that are you know, high priority for protection in the state. Things like that would increase um, uh, applications public good. Um, you know, if, if it's going to protect other bodies of water, if it's going to, like Kim was mentioning, uh, if, if it's mainly, mainly going to be targeting uh, you know, public fishing access or a public beach, something like that. Um, for projects, there, there are a few projects. I think there's two pesticide permits currently for lakes that don't have public beaches, uh, but they do, they may, I think only one doesn't have any public access at all. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're, these are only approved for lakes uh, that have some sort of public benefit by by controlling the the, the plant or the, the animal. Uh, and again, that's kind of how we really start to, to zone in on this. And again, whenever we look at something, if, if there was a new invasive species uh, you know, that was introduced, something like a, a high risk plant like hydrilla, um, the, the benefit for controlling a plant like hydrilla, which is anywhere from, from 10 to 20 times more invasive uh, than our most common invasive species, Eurasian water milfoil, uh, the public benefit of controlling that plant would be incredibly high, um, and, and that would really raise this bar up. Um, so we really want to make sure that, again, this is kind of where all of those other conditions kind of come together to make sure that that everything is working in tandem and making sure that that we're not going to be impacting anything negatively. Um, we, we really only want there to be positive outcomes from these from these applications. And so, yeah, again, you can kind of see through through, through some of these that um, there there is a state park. There, there's no state park on Lake Fairley, so that that's kind of a negative mark on it. But there is public access to Lake Fairley. It's a very commonly used body of water throughout the state. Um, it's one of our more more traffic lakes, and so that, that there there is a public benefit to controlling a highly invasive plant that creates mats and disrupts navigation, disrupts fisheries, um, that that causes you know creates havoc for both the environment and the public use. Um, and so that's that's why this application was, or one of the five reasons this application was approved, um, was because there was a public benefit to be achieved by controlling this plant in this body of water. Thanks, Owen. Does anybody have any questions about um, how the conditions are set at this time and looking at the public benefit and public good? So as we don't have a, um, a definition for public good, there is a public good determination document for lake encroachment permitting in Vermont. Um, so it's stated here. <laughs> I'm, I don't, I'm not going to read through it, but certainly if the members feel that we should have some sort of definition for what public good or pe public benefit is, we can look at this document. Just a, a quick question. Um, I know you, <clears throat> you just went through a, a series of kind of, I don't know, review questions that the, the secretary looks at for mm -hmm. uh, uh, public benefit. Mm -hmm. um, where where are those aren't in the statute though, right? Those are somewhere else. Uh, no, that's in the in how we assess them. So, Olin, would you like to mention that? Yeah, that that's within it. Same with same with the rest of these questions that are, that we've kind of talked about. It, it's with our an an internal internal review procedure. It's not the signed internal review procedure um, that 
the departments look at, but that's within our permitting process. So our standard operating procedures include these questions, and that's how we go through this this regulator, regulatory process. Um, so okay. they're not included are, in statute. Are they are they somewhere on the the DEC website, or or where would someone from the public find question. those? I don't know if they're on our website. Um, okay, it's more of an internal an internal review process. Yeah, but I mean, they are, these are all, if if, if the public requested them, maybe it's a good idea to post this on our website. I yeah, know I've they're brought they're public up. documents, they're just not like. Right, we just haven't posted them. All right, mm -hmm. yeah. thanks. Yeah, I know that in the um, permit webpage, some of these questions are listed there. Um, it's more of a question towards the applicant. So have you thought about some of these questions here? And so, but it's not, we don't have a internal um, memo or procedures as written as yet, but we certainly can if that's the uh, recommendation from the committee members. Okay, and I also was wondering um, whether we should really try to ter determine and target what's aquatic nuisance. Uh, it's kind of defined in statute now. It includes all aquatic plants, um, native or invasive. Um, just wondering if we should really establish a better list of what aquatic nuisances are and maybe call out that it should be an invasive species. Um, and then whether we should also include all the invasive fish and other invasive animals that we know about um, that are found in Vermont, but we don't list them as an aquatic nuisance at this time. I'll, I'll raise one issue that's been discussed quite a bit over the past <laughs> decade or so, and that's that there's some question as to whether sea lamprey are native or mm. invasive. Um, there, yeah. There's no good historic record of sea lamprey being in Lake Champlain until the 1950s, um, but there's some genetic studies that suggested that they're genetically diverse and probably not a recent invasive. Um, so as we discuss whether we should just have it apply to invasive nuisance species that that would have an impact on sea lamprey control. Mm -hmm. Good point. And with that, there are also a handful of projects that are not pesticide related, but there are a handful of projects within the state that are not for the control of invasive species, like there are there are and two bladderwort, uh, which is a aquatic plant. Um, native. Yeah, a native aquatic plant that just likes to grow prolifically sometimes. Um, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the the aquatic nuisance control statute was put in place uh, before Eurasian milfoil was in Vermont. Is that correct? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think it, I think it was maybe, no, I think it was the, the result of a quad of Eurasia water milfoil. Uh, that's how the statute came to be. Um, but I know that, and this is just historical antidotes and observations that, um, some native plants were considered aquatic nuisances and that's why it, the def definition was broad. Okay. To not just include invasive species. Okay, I thought Ginny Garrison had told me that uh, it started with like curly leaf pondweed and and other native species prior mm -hmm. to Eurasian milfoil being introduced. But uh, okay, maybe yeah, not. I didn't, yeah, I didn't hear that. Um, but you've been around longer than I have, Eric, so you may know more. <laughs> and Good you know, long. my our public record or our records are being scanned or something. I don't know even know where all of our old records hard copy records are at this point. Um, so it would be really tough to figure that out. Probably be easier to just call her. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so does anybody have any questions about our, port, our approach to determining public benefit or public good? Um, is it lacking? I, I think the additional information that you laid out for the internal mm. review process is is good and addresses a lot of the questions I had. I think maybe if that was just kind of more more visible or posted somewhere for yeah. the public, it would be good. Definitely. I think that could be true for all of these terms as well of how we assess them. Not just public good, but all of the conditions. <clears throat> OK, so that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully that was helpful for folks. And so it's two o'clock. And now I'm going to ask that the members, hopefully, is Dr. Bress still on? Yes. Dr. Bress, I'm not sure if you can get to the report, if you st are still on your phone. Uh, yeah, I can. OK. So um, as if the members can open up the draft report, I'm not going to share it. And if we can all open it up, um, that would be very helpful. It, it is in the working documents folder under working draft. And as you can see, or maybe not be able to see that Sarah, Olin, and myself have really filled out a lot of the information here. So it may be easier to actually open it up um, in, in desktop app. app. Um, and that way you won't see the comments, but you know, I think we tried to clean it up because there's a lot of movement back and forth between all of us on um, the information that is um, put into the report. So just going through the first, the whole report, um, I can see some folks are in here. I think everybody is in here. Great. Um, so the, I just um, included the eight, Act 57 highlights, so we can just have those at the top that won't be included in the final report. It's just to call those out. So it was getting a little confusing uh, with the bold of trying to separate out sections and so on and so forth. So I changed the blue, te blue the <laughs> Act 57 highlights to blue so we can separate those out a little more so we don't lose track of what is charged by this group. So it really <clears throat> starts on scope on page one, and you can see the outline has maintained some of the integrity as best I could. Um, so if there is some questions, please definitely ask. Um, so I also included an overview of Title 10, Chapter 50 um, with the Aquatic Nuisance Control Statute as listed to call that out, that that's what this report is really um, in looking at. And then the Aquatic Nuisance Control Permit 1455 as well. So I thought that would be helpful to include that in the report. I can certainly take that out if the group feels that the legislative committee who reviews this should understand those statutes already. Yeah, my my only um, comment about including that um, is just a question of length. So right now the report is already 20 pages, um, and I know there are some sections that haven't been written, so I think uh, we might we might have sections in there that, like you said, could be really good and um, relevant to people who are thinking about it, but it might not stick very closely to exactly what the legislative um, requirements are for the report. 
So mm -hmm. that's just a comment. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm a bit challenged by that too. If this is a standalone document, should we include the permit um, statutes in there already or should we just um, make note of those? And can we just add it as an appendix? Oh, that's a good idea. Brilliant. Or if it, I mean, it's also the document will be available online. The link is the way it is right mm -hmm. now is pretty, pretty great because you okay. can go there if you want to and not if you don't. And having the section so people understand the scope of it and where to go. I like mm -hmm. it. I sort of like it where it is the, or the way it is. OK, so I can maybe um, just include a link and discuss it and try to shorten it. Yeah, and have the pardon yeah just describe it okay thank you so uh, going to section e the recommendations of the committee shall include the types of pesticides chemicals other pe than pesticides or biological controls approved for, approved for use and why they're approved instead of non-chemical controls. So obviously this is a pretty big section because we're going through each uh, herbicide or pesticide that's being used. I thought it would be helpful to call out the Agricultural Innovation Board uh, as they do provide the approvals for pesticides to be used. So that's an addition um, to our original um, outline. And then an overview of the use of pesticides in Vermont waters. I think we did discuss that a little bit more, but kind of calling that out a little bit of how there is an internal procedure with how we use these uh, pesticides. Um, sorry, Kim. Um just looking at that section on the AIB, I know that no one, the statute didn't assign any member from the Agency of Agriculture. Um, just thinking back to this year, uh, it, if I wrote this section, I may have written it incorrectly. Um, I don't I don't recall that the AIB reviewed, well, well I guess it's a question for, for Olin. Did, does the AIB confirm the applications for pesticide use under the ANC program? So the way that it works is, this is just for the entire committee and for the public that's here, the Agency of Agricultural Pharma Markets has, has the pesticide registered in the state. And so it's been reviewed by them for general use, but not for specific project use. Um, and then within that, then, then we get the applications. Um, they are not a part of our... Um, they're not a part of the internal review procedure. Uh, so they do not review individual applications for pesticide use. However, within our permit conditions for the use of pesticides in the state, one of two of the conditions, two of the conditions um, reference the Agency of Agriculture. So condition, I believe it's condition A2 in, in all permits require that all applicants caters of the pesticide be registered within the state of Vermont. So they are actually required to whatever the process is to become a registered applicator for the use of pesticides. That person has to go through that. And then condition A3 calls out that the agency of agriculture must be notified of a pending application of a pending implementation of a project. So if, uh, I know that right, I think today, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife is using lampreside in, in the Pulte River, and there is a representative from the Agency of Agriculture there to review that application. Um, so they're not with they're not a part of the internal review procedure, and that's because they've already reviewed the pesticide. Um, if we feel that they should be included, um, then that's something that that may need to be worked out with their commissioner. But um, that's kind of how it works internally. Thanks. <laughs> Excuse me. So getting um, through, I just want to call attention that it's 203 
and we have on the agenda that we will be setting the agenda items for next meeting so we can continue going through this if you all feel, feel it's helpful and we could just be really speedy at creating the new agenda items although eric has a hand up okay eric um yeah i i think this issue of you know the role of agency of agriculture has come up a couple of times now and i i was on the the former um, pesticide advisory council with Sarah for I think 25 years for me. Um, so it's just to parse it out, my understanding is that the Agency of Agriculture registers the pesticide. They say yes, this pesticide can be used in Vermont, and basically that is at according to the label. So they just give it the blessing. Yes, this can be used. If they have concerns, they're like, no, we won't register this in Vermont. You cannot use this pesticide. So it's sort of a, a yes, no at the, the label rates and methods. Um, and then what, what happens in processes like the aquatic nuisance control permit is that additional conditions get put on, saying, okay, you can only use it on these dates and this location at this rate. And all of those additional requirements are, are not under agency of ag. So when they come out on uh, application site to check it. They're just making sure, are you using the right PPE? Are you doing it, you know, are you applying it according to the label and not violating any of those sort of restrictions? Um, so they still have a role, but it's different from from sort of the fine tuning that a permit like the Aquatic Nuisance Control Permit would do. Thanks for making that distinction. Uh, we can clean that up a little bit. If anybody wants to make a stab at it. Uh, so then henceforth in the report, we go through each uh, herbicide or pesticide that is used and how it's used when it was registered by EPA. We're still looking into when it may have been registered registered by Vermont Agriculture, Agency of Agriculture. Some of the data is missing. So we hopefully will have that in the final report. And then we review the chemicals other than pesticides, biological controls, and then the non-chemical controls. I would like to input cost per acre if I can get that information somehow, some way for all of these control mechanisms and practices um, within the next two weeks. Uh, we still have to have some ecotoxology reports from DEC, uh, but Sarah was helpful and added the public health assessments. And maybe that could be pared down a little bit too. It's a pretty large section, so. Um, and then what the current standards are. So it talks about precautions. And so I list what the basically the internal review procedure of, of how we go through the different pre precautions and protections and look at those different non-target environmental impacts and health impacts. And um, basically also look at what protections are in place in the permit. So that's a pretty lengthy component as well. Again, what just what page to, are you on, Kim? I'm oh, just trying to keep up with you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I am going pretty quickly because our time is limited. I'm on page 15. And then what are some limitations on the use of pesticides? On page 15, some projects that have been denied and why they were denied. And finding any potential gaps 
Um, I think the gaps may be that we should better define what these conditions are, as was already suggested by Eric. And then F are some recommended legislative changes. Again, maybe we can look at what are the present standards and then what other standards should we incorporate, if at all? Uh, are, are our standards already good enough? Um, do we look at all the different um, impacts and how, how we assess them? Um, those procedures are in place. I, I just don't feel like we put them out and uh, adver advertise those to the public or have a public facing document. And so we can, uh, now I'm on page 17 of, you know, looking through those definitions we just reviewed and pulling in some of those suggestions. and what amendments may be necessary for the application that improves the opportunity for interested parties. Uh, so we do ask for public input and maybe Olin, if you would just like to provide a quick synopsis of how we do that. Sure, yeah, so um, this gets brought up a lot. Uh, and so public input, I think we've talked about this in a prior meeting, um, but public input comes through the environmental notice bulletin. So whenever an application comes in, comes in, anybody that's or anybody that's registered to be notified receives a notification that an application has come in. Uh, and then whenever a draft decision um, is made, then another another notification with that draft decision, any application materials that are included. Uh, any appendixes, uh, anything like that. Those are then included in that draft decision. Um, during, and then there's a 30 day period while it's on the environmental notice bulletin. Um, and while, when it's there, that's when uh, the public has a, uh, a opportunity to comment on the application and the draft decision. If a draft decision receives no comments, then that's fine. Um, and, and we go through that. If a draft decision does receive comments before we create a final decision, those comments are responded to. I um, mean, they may be responded to, responded to with the final decision, um, but they are all gone through and, and answered. And there's a separate document that we have um, that lays out how we respond to those comments. Um, and so, and then the public notification requirements this is something that I think uh, some people have uh, commented that we need to improve this by requiring notification before an application can even be submitted. Um, but we currently conditions require that a permittee notify uh, any adjacent um, landowners to the water body and everybody a mile downstream be notified of uh, when a water body is to be treated with a, a chemical and um, they're required to treat that or they're required to put out that notice 30 days prior to the treatment. It includes physical copies. It includes copies at any and all public accesses on the lake. It includes copies um, along the roadside. It includes a website that must be uh, provided. Uh, and then with that, um, just as kind of an aside, if there is any impact, uh, the permittee is required to provide drinking water or potable water to anybody that requ requests it. Um, and that's kind of what this notice is for. That that all occurs after a permit's issued, correct? Yes, that is in the and and that is in the um, conditions of the permit. But yeah, we within the permit, we don't have the ability to require notification before an application comes out because there's not a permit yet. So if if a recommendation through this com committee comes in that an application must notify the public, then that would have to come in. Uh, Hannah may be able to comment on that, but that would have to be Im implemented some way else. Um, so we don't have the ability to do that within a condition. I Yeah, I will just quickly note that um, 
the a few years ago, the agency adopted Chapter 170, so it's it was an attempt to sort of make all of our permit processes consistent. Um, so that's what Olin's referring to here. The process is in statute, but the agency also does have flexibility um, to implement additional notice requirements when necessary. Yeah, so I noted that in the comments for um, some information, I believe, Amy, you uh, provided so we can call out some of those additional statutes so we can make sure that we um, do this in a correct manner. OK, and um, <clears throat> then I also added uh, two things. Um, actually, no, the public comments compilation we already agreed on in the um, in the outline. Uh, so I do want to call your attention to any public comments that I have received are in the folder under public comments received. <laughs> so uh, please, if you have time to review those comments, that would be helpful. So we will compile those in some form and fashion in the report. And then um, also I included references. So I think there's a lot of documentation that we're referencing. So we should include references in the report as well. So that's in addition to our first outline. OK. So I noticed um, in the agenda that the times are wrong. So we that's perfect that we actually are on time now. <laughs> uh, so I originally ended the meeting at 1230. So yay, we have 15 more minutes, so that's great. Um, so does anybody have any more comments about the report? And of course, you can continue to just add things as you see them. Um, we're all working away at it. I think Ola and Sarah and I are, are uh, getting really good at um, approving and accepting track changes. Yeah, Kim, have we um, have we heard from all members of the committee that they can indeed access the report and are able to read it and get, you know, put text in and stuff? I just heard from Ellen that she could not get into it. So I did send her a copy prior to the meeting. So we'll work through uh, how to get her permissions. And Dr. Brass, I don't know if you also may have difficulty in getting into that document. Is um, Can you let us know no, if you can get in? I, I have it on my computer. OK, brilliant. OK, so Alan, we just need to work with you. And you're muted. I will try the process again uh, and, and let you know if I have trouble. Thank you. OK, thank you. Do you while I am um, unmuted, do you want to bring up again the issue I addressed uh, when we chatted briefly before the meeting? Oh, yes, thanks for the reminder. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, Alan, would you like to explain it? Yeah, quite simply, I was sent an email by a, a, a a semi colleague, uh, an acquaintance who is working with Lake Sean Plain Committee, and she's actually now also working with the uh, Conservation Law Foundation. And she said she and a colleague from uh, LCC wanted to come over and talk to me about the ANC. A and I said, What about? <laughs> and she, I didn't get a good answer. So um, they want to come and talk to me for half an hour. They're outside the committee. I, they're not public. Um, I don't know what they have in mind. Um, is it OK for me to do that? Uh, you, you can say like it sounds like there's going to a report is on a on a fine time schedule and we should talk before it gets too far. <laughs> not sure what to do with that. My recommendation was that we refer Ellen to the website, which is the public facing document and just refer to the information that is there. Right. Does anybody Thank else have any other recommendations? Does Hannah have a recommendation on that? <laughs> there's I mean, there's 
no reason, Ellen, why you wouldn't be able to have a conversation in your profession in a professional context. I wonder if there might be value in these folks talking to the whole committee. Um, I mean, you know, for maybe a 15 minute present. I don't I don't know. I There isn't okay. a there isn't a legal reason why you wouldn't be able to be discussing Correct. that as Perfect. part of your right. your <laughs> professional right. work. Um, okay. And and thank you for that recommendation. I mean, if they if they have concerns or input or whatever, I could say, please attend the next meeting and, and, and you can bring them to the group. Yeah, and I believe that there might be some members of the uh, um, public who've been, you know, on these meetings that are affiliated with LCC. I know Jared Carpenter at one point was here, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I think that if they have comments that would be relevant to the committee's discussion, it might help to hear those as a group. Oh, perfect. And, yeah, and or to have them submitted in writing. Yeah. yeah. Especially if That's it's a a lengthy comments. Yeah. 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 Because we are limited to 15 minutes for the public. And right. So we want to make sure that we are able to, you know, provide that time for anybody who's available. Gotcha. Okay, so I believe we are on agenda items for the next meeting. I think it's going to be a review the draft. Continue to review the draft. Cool. And maybe just take the whole meeting to review the draft. It's also possible that we would have more time to hear from the public. Yeah, it might be a good time to do that. And somebody said uh, that there was some additional information or or perhaps even statutes on on the, the public uh, outreach process or or public notice process. If mm -hmm. if we could just get some more information on that, like you said, Olin, I know that's been a, a hot topic and it'd be just nice to know what what the sidebars are on that already um, before we go trying to reinvent the wheel. That's a great idea. So maybe we can have the similar agenda as we had today with, um, you know, reviewing some of those concerns with the public notice process, process and presenting those that information, then review the draft and then open to public comments and or develop agenda items. Um, so the agenda items will likely be quick because hopefully the report will be done <laughs> in a couple of weeks or at least the first draft and then it will go to our commissioners. So I think and, following. And so, so, go ahead. Sorry, Sarah. Kim, I, I, I was just going to add. Uh, so I think that means that any committee members who have suggested text or um, language uh, need to make sure that they get it in. Is it by the next meeting by October 31st? Yeah, I think that we could compile those into the first draft and the, the end section um, and then give time to our commissioners to to make suggestions. And then if we're able to incorporate any public suggestions, I think that's something that the group would have to decide on because I think originally we were just going to try to put the report together and do our best in the short timeline um, to really stay on uh, the track and the um, with the outline that we already have set and not try to incorporate too much of, of the public comments um because that's going to take a longer time to be sure to incorporate everyone's suggestions so that's up to the the group here of whether we want to you know make those last few meetings just discussing those public comments and how to include those in the final report Uh, does anybody have any comments to share on what I just mentioned? 
Well, I, I think one thing we talked about in in sort of our initial, hey, let's let's get together and, and figure out what calendar dates work is that the, the public input process doesn't sort of end with us, that we're making a recommendation to the legislature, mm -hmm. which has its own very open and, and public process. So sure. we'll certainly do our best to hear the public and, you know, hear their comments, um, but it doesn't end when when the report is submitted. That's true. Yeah. Thanks for that reminder, Eric. <laughs> OK, so I have. Um, approved the meeting minutes and review public notice process and a presentation. Um, next agenda item is to continue to review the draft and public comments and then close. OK. And so let's we have about six minutes left, but if nobody has any other comments on those agenda items, we can open up to the public. OK. I don't see anybody saying no. Oh, OK. So community members OK with moving to public comments? See shaking of heads. Great. OK, so we will open up the floor to public comments. Can you please raise your hand? And we'll try to get to everyone. Please know that there may be others that are waiting to provide a comment. So please be succinct and try to keep your comment brief. John, Governor, you can unmute and provide your comment. Well, I'm glad I've been promoted to governor. I, uh, or govern, uh, governor, governor, <laughs> sorry. The family will be very pleased to <laughs> learn and uh, quite surprised. Um, but That's a tongue twister, I your last I didn't name. Run. But yeah, my name is John Groveman. I'm the Groveman, policy and water program director for VNRC. And I'll be really brief, just kind of, you know, uh, jumping off of just what I heard at the very end of the meeting that I, so just for, just so people understand, you know, to Ellen's point, so VNRC, and I said this last time, VNRC and Lake Champlain Committee and Conservation Law Foundation and the Connecticut River Conservancy, we've all been working together on this, going back to the, um, we were part of the stakeholder group and then we also participated in the legislative discussion. So, you know, I think that Lake Champlain Committee and CLF just really wanted to um, share some technical viewpoints and kind of how the process works and I think it would be great if there was time allotted for our group to come and and make you know we could you know listening to this meeting I, I think what we will do is put together written recommendations um, for you and I, I, I think it would be helpful for the committee to hear briefly us kind of summarize those um, because reading the written page is good but I think being able to kind of hear us explain um, you know, what changes we think might be appropriate and why, and maybe even have a, a, a short back and forth about it would be better. So we're going to do that. But just to highlight a couple of things that we're certainly going to comment on is I'm really glad that, um, you know, towards the end of the discussion, um, you know, I think the discussion about better definitions of the statutory criteria is good. And I think that is needed to better define those terms. But you know, one thing that we've been thinking about, and we said this at the stakeholder meeting, is, you know, is the right, is, is the, the way the criteria are laid out in terms of, you know, um, alternatives, um, non-chemical alternatives and negligible risk and public benefit, you know, are those the right questions in the right order? And I, and, you know, I think we think it's very important in terms of deciding when and when not to use these chemicals, not only to have, you know, really clear terms, um, and have an understanding of what they mean, but you know, when is there, you know, how are we evaluating when there is a real need for chemical versus non-chemical alternatives, and when it's appropriate to use uh, chemicals? And I, I, as again, so I think defining the terms is is helpful, but I don't. I think we'll present some suggestions for, you know, maybe a different way to look at the criteria in the process. And I think the public benefit criteria does probably encapsulate the issue of what's the need 
what's the harm that's being caused by the invasive and um, when to use a chemical versus not. But as you noted, it's not a defined term and it really is pretty open-ended. And I would just, I would say my reaction to looking at the lakes and ponds um, encro encroachment definition of public good is I don't think that fits. I think this is a different situation. And I'd ask the committee to consider that as it looks at that definition, because I don't, I think that the public good involved with, you know, putting in docks or marinas or those sort of uses um, of public waters is different than, than using a chemical um, and defining public benefit that way. And I do, we will definitely be commenting on the notice procedure. I'm really, I, I'm grateful that Eric clarified that um, the notice that was discussed is after the permit is issued. And um, uh, as Hannah noted, uh, it's a, it's a, it, there is a, a statute now about notice for of different types of permits. And the notice for this permit is sort of middling, you know, in terms of who gets notice and what the process is. And I, I, our feeling is that, you know, the use of chemicals in public waters requires more robust notice and outreach and opportunity to weigh in. But we can lay that all out in our written comments. And if there's a chance to flesh that out at a future meeting. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Any other comments? <clears throat> Oops, I raised my own hand. I uh, just want to call your attention to some comments that were added in the chat box uh, by various public citizens and different organizations. So we'll try to capture those in the public compilation for the report as well. I think some of those are more just comments, maybe not so much as questions. So please, if you wouldn't mind, please send the comments through the um, the email that is on the website. I think it would just be a lot easier to have them all in one. And rather than commenting on what we said, to comment on this whole uh, study in the committee. I think that would make it a lot easier for, for me, for sure. So, um, so thank you for doing that. I appreciate your efforts to please use the website um, email to get comments to this committee. Uh, Pat, you briefly raised your hand. Did you want to um, respond or comment to the group? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Kim. Sorry. Okay. I just I, I wanted to say a couple of things um, about the public notice um, just to clarify. Um, Public notice is required when a permit application is submitted, as well as pre, you know, if a if a permit is approved, then there's also another public notice um, requirement prior to treatment. So there are two requirements right now. Now, maybe that's not enough, but it should be clear that there are actually already two um, requirements. And that requires all abutters up to one mile down from the treatment area. So it's it's quite a large um, amount. Um, the other thing um, I wanted to say is I think that it's important for the committee to hear from the lakes that have been through this process. Um, I think the real life experience um, is important. Um, so perhaps if the committee is going to provide um, some time for a presentation directly to the committee during committee meeting time, it would be good to have a presentation from um, one or more of the lakes that have actually been through the entire process and can really point out how it actually works, how, how lake associations work through the process. Um, and, you know, that might also bring out some, some of the potential um, weaknesses in the process or confusions in the process as well. But I think it's important to hear from from the people who actually have done this work, um, who actually do the work and continue to do the work hands-on. Um, and those are um, the 12 lakes that um, have received permits and been through the process. So I just wanted to mention that, and I hope that if you're gonna make time for other presentations, you'll make time for that presentation as well. I think it's important to hear that information. 
So that's all that's all I was gonna say today. Thanks, Kim. And I see Thanks, other hands Pat. are up anyway. Thank you. Thanks for your comment, Pat. Uh, we'll move to Jeff Schumann. Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, and thank you to the uh, committee members for your time and effort uh, that you're dedicating to this important issue. Uh, my name is Jeff Schumann. I'm the president of the Lake Dunmore Fern Lake Association. And I live in Salisbury at the north end of Lake Dunmore on Browns Bay, right across from Key Wade's Anwe waterfront. I've been involved in the eradication mitigation milfoil process uh, since its inception here at the lake in the 1990s as a hand puller and a diver, and now as the leader of the organization that uses both DASH and Procellicor to accomplish our mission. And as Pat said, we have quite a bit of data on uh, all of the work we've been doing since the 90s, and, and we'd be very happy to put it together, and we've got it together in many different forms, and, and share it with the committee if you're so interested in, uh, in seeing some of that. But I can tell you that uh, the combination of DASH and Procellicor have made a huge difference for us here at the lake, both uh, in terms of our ability to control milfoil, but also financially. Um, the use of Procellicor has allowed us to go from six DASH boats down to one DASH boat operating, and uh, we're pulling less milfoil out of the lake now than we used to uh, be prior to starting to use the uh, Procellicor as part of our treatment strategy. So I want to thank you again for your help, and certainly I'll be uh, here to, uh, to provide any other information you'd be interested in getting. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that. Is there any other public citizens groups that would like to comment? <clears throat> Luca. Luca, are you there? You may have to unmute. Does that work? Yep, we hear you now. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead. Luca, you muted yourself again. I unfortunately don't have the ability to unmute Luca. Okay. Another opportunity. <clears throat> okay, Luca, if you can just send that comment to me via email, that would be most helpful. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Oh boy, what a less okay. than a computer button, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very briefly, um, Luca Conti, president of Lake Bombazine Preservation Trust. I'm one of the applicants for the Procellicor application on Lake Bombazine along with the LBA. Um, I just wanted to briefly address the notification uh, issue again. Let's be sure I've done five to 10 applications, mostly for DASH, benthic barriers, of course, the one for Procellicor. And every time I did that, there's a boots on the ground getting letters to people's mailboxes in the mail to every person around Lake Bombazine, 890 six or so addresses, depending upon which source you use. I usually use the Castleton uh, town list, but I wanna be sure that we're clear on this notification. Uh, that letter that goes out is a one page document uh, written and mandated by the uh, DEC, and it, it connects people to the environmental notice board as uh, Olin was pointing out before, that they will get notified directly once they're registered and that their email is in the system. But also that document, my suggestion would be that document is only a page, it's not even both sides of a page. And it certainly would be a very easy place to put links to all of the things that people were suggesting. A link to the five requirements for an application, uh, definition of notice of public good, any of those issues that you wanted to link would be very easy to put in that document. Uh, that document and the process require an individual uh, just to know ahead of time that there is an environmental notice board, but that's one of the reasons why we mail or hand carry these documents to mailboxes. Uh, and then once they have that document, it starts their process going of being informed when many people have said they haven't been informed. Now, I won't go through all the reasons why people get or don't get letters 
and numbers that come back to me. But the point is, there's still a very systematic process that we have to follow as applicants to get information in front of the community. Uh, interestingly, the towns have never asked for any information. They've never once come to me and said, you know, what are you doing here? Can we get information at a public meeting, et cetera? We typically, as lake organizations, have to go to the towns and say, you know, there's concern here. Maybe we should set up a meeting. And something like that was done in this last round with Bricellacor. But frankly, it was a very one sided, the town showing that they were in support of people who did not want the application to go through. So, my point here is only to emphasize that the ENB system is a very uh, robust system. Those of us who apply take it seriously. And we do make the effort to get as much and as many people contacted as part of that process because we want everybody to know and we want them to support, not the least of which is people who know about it and are in support of it will fund it financially. And as we all know, the state does not pay for these. It's the private organizations and the lakefront homeowners that collect monies for these projects. So I'll end there. I don't want to belabor the point, but uh, please know that there's boots on the ground for notification and we work hard to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. <clears throat> um, OK, anybody else that would like to comment? <clears throat> OK, I don't see anyone that's raising their hand. <clears throat> so uh, I will ask if the committee members would like to end the meeting. early again wow this is great <clears throat> so we will have the recording up as soon as possible we're going through um website platform transitions right now so it may take some time <clears throat> so i apologize for the delay but we'll get it up as soon as possible <clears throat> so um i'm good with calling the meeting what, what's our next meeting date, Kim? Oh, I'm sorry. I should note that. I should know it already. I just <laughs> is it on the 31st? Is that our next or is there yes, one before I that? Yes, I believe I put it in the agenda. <clears throat> October 31st. Yes. OK, on great. Halloween. Thank you. So if you show up in a costume, you get points. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Well, thank all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.